Hello, welcome to PMLS2 Laboratory Week 2. So for this session, we will have Activity 3. And that would be areas of the laboratory and professionals in the laboratory. Okay, so for the specific learning objectives, one, no, at the end of this activity, students should be able to distinguish the different types of healthcare settings. Two, enumerate the clinical areas of the laboratory and the various types of procedures performed in each area. Identify departments within the hospital and explain their function. And identify members of the laboratory staff describe their duties as well as their educational levels. Okay, so to start off, okay, to be able to accomplish our first objective, which is to identify the different types of uh, healthcare settings. So our first topic are the different types of healthcare settings. So the term Healthcare setting represents a broad array of services and places where healthcare occurs, including okay, acute care hospitals. So acute care hospitals provide uh, short-term patient care. You know? The term acute care encompasses a range of clinical healthcare functions like uh, emergency medicine, trauma care, uh, pre-hospital emergency care, uh, acute care surgery, critical care, and short-term inpatient stabilization. Urgent care centers, these are uh, ambulatory care types of uh, facilities. Okay, So they usually uh, provide medical care outside a hospital emergency department. Okay? So usually uh, for walk-in patients. Okay, so example, uh, a patient would walk in to have his or her uh, injured ankle checked or to um, determine whether a child's fever is due to an infection or not. Okay, so similar to how we go through doctor's clinics. Okay, so uh, that's how urgent care centers would be like. Okay, and then we have rehabilitation centers, okay, so like drug rehab centers, okay, and then we have uh, long-term care facilities like uh, nursing homes or homes for the aged, okay, and then we have specialized outpatient uh, services like uh, kidney clinics or hemodialysis centers, okay, or dentist's clinic, um, podiatrist or chiropractors or uh, pain management clinics. So those are examples of specialized outpatient services. Okay, so they offer treatment or services to a particular uh, group or types of patients. Okay? And then we have outpatient surgery centers. Okay? So uh, this is where you go to and need to remove a small cyst or a small mole, you know, so, or you'll have to have a, a wound stitched up, okay? small wound stitched up. So those are examples of outpatient surgery centers. So these are the different types of healthcare settings. So each of these settings require the aid of the uh, laboratory you know, for diagnostic as well as treatment monitoring purposes. And most of the time, it would be the phlebotomist would be called in to collect the most commonly assayed specimen, which is blood. So in this case, the phlebotomist serves as the laboratory representative because he or she would be the person from the laboratory with whom most of the healthcare staff and patients would have to have contact with. Okay. So let's move on to our next focus, the hospital departments. No? So to answer uh, another 
uh, objective to be able to accomplish another objective. So let's move to our next topic. So the hospital department. So this was uh, discussed already in the first lecture, no? um, first discussion in your lecture, PMLS2 lecture class. Okay, so uh, areas in the hospital. Okay, so these are also known as ancillary hospital areas. So we have the uh, administration offices, or which also would include the medical records. Okay, so this is where we go to if we need to follow up on our medical records or to follow up on our bills, you know, statement of accounts or for uh, the hospital stay, etc. Okay. And then we have environmental services, which are responsible for making sure that uh, the rooms in the hospital are sterile and clean. They're also in charge of taking care of the hospital trash. Okay. And then we have the dietary services, which is in charge of making sure that the uh, patients are receiving you know, their um, daily uh, nutritional requirements as prescribed by their doctors or physicians. And then, of course, the nursing services, which the hospital cannot go without. So each of the special areas in the lab would have a nurse's uh, ward. Okay? Uh, so each floor would have or each uh, department. You know? would have that offers services to patients, would have a nurse's ward, okay? And then we have here the central supply area where we gather uh, fresh linen you know, and other things that each of the department in the hospital would require. And then, of course, uh, the pharmacy you know, where we uh, buy okay, medicines needed for treatment. Okay, so other areas include, of course, the clinical laboratory, the EEG center, the EKG center or the heart station, the PT center, okay? and then the radiology department, okay, where you go to to have your x-rays, the RT department, and in some hospitals, they do have specialized labs like the gastrointestinal lab. Okay. And then areas and types of nursing care. Okay, so in the hospital, we have specific areas where a special type of care is offered, like in ICU. You know? So we have different types of ICU in the hospitals. We have ICU for uh, patients who, has, who have just had heart surgeries or problems uh, pertaining to their circulatory system. We have ICUs for neonates. You know? We have ICUs for children and so on. Okay? So each of these uh, ICU you know, areas uh, function to serve you know, specific types of uh, patients, you know? uh, focusing on a particular concern. And the nurses here, actually are trained you know, to take care of uh, patients that are in this room. Then we have emergency care. Okay? So we have ER nurses as well, you know, so offering their services. Okay? So they provide uh, emergency treatment to patients that would require it. And then we have the newborn care or the nursery. Okay? So you have nurses also there to offer um, care to neonates or newborn infants, and then obstetric care, so ob area or ob ward, you know, the cancer ward or the oncology care area, and pediatric care, okay? So in all of these areas, okay, uh, the phlebotomist would be present you know, to collect blood samples for the patients. Okay, so moving on to our, so other areas, by the way, other areas not included were already discussed previously in the lecture. So that would include um, uh, the speech therapy center, the um, occupational therapist, 
So some hospitals have specific offices for those services, others may not. Okay? And then we have, um, basically that's it. No? So the rest uh, have been already discussed. No? So those who are not included in the pictures are the OT and the ST, no? speech therapy and the occupational therapy. Okay, so moving on to our, uh, to satisfy another objective. So we have the clinical laboratory. Okay, so according to the objective, we are uh, supposed to be able to discuss uh, the different areas in the clinical laboratory and uh, provide examples for the tests that are usually uh, performed in those areas. So let's start with naming not the different uh, areas in a clinical laboratory. Okay, so we have microbiology, we have hematology, clinical chemistry area, the immunology and serology area, immunohematology or the blood banking area, and clinical microscopy, which is also known as the uh, uripara area. So urinalysis and parasitology area. Okay, so to start off, Okay, uh, we have the microbiology section. Okay, so the microbiome lab is an area in the clinical lab where samples are usually examined to determine the presence of uh, infectious agents or causative agents that might be responsible for the patient's disease or illness. Okay, it has four subsections, namely bacteriology, you know, which deals with uh, the study of different bacterial uh, organisms, mycobacteriology, which is actually a subsection of bacteriology, which focuses only on uh, the TB bacilli or mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then we have mycology, which focuses on um, fungal elements, and of course, virology, which deals with the infectious agent called viruses. Okay, so okay, so the basic procedures done in the microbiology lab can be collectively called or summarized as methods of identification. Okay, so the methods of identification includes uh, microscopic methods, culture biochemical testing, serological testing, and molecular diagnostic methods. Now for microscopic methods, they're usually done to visually identify the causative agents. Okay? So to identify bacteria, we can perform uh, wet mounts or most commonly we perform gram staining. Okay? So gram staining is a basic uh, staining procedure performed in the bacteriology laboratory because uh, we do this to initially group our organisms into uh, gram positive, the purple ones, and gram negative, the pink or reddish ones. Okay? Now for mycobacteriology, we perform a, another example of a differential staining method, which is called acid fast staining. Okay, so this is done to allow us to see um, acid fast organisms like the TB bacilli. Okay, so in this staining method, the TB bacilli are stained red, while those that are non TB bacilli are stained blue. The environment are also, or the background, are also stained blue. Okay. Now, to identify fungal elements, we usually uh, use potassium hydroxide or to allow enhanced visualization, uh, we can use lactophenol cotton blue like this one. Okay. Amazing, right? So um, it gives us a better illustration of what fungal elements would look like under the microscope. For potassium hydroxide, they're usually colorless. They just uh, um, become visible because of the effect of uh, 
the potassium hydroxide on the organism, okay? but there's no color. But for lactophenol cotton blue, this is how they would look like under the microscope. So this is aspergillus, the fungi aspergillus. Or we could also use fluorescent staining methods like the calcofluor white. Okay, so this is a fluorescent staining technique. So the background is black and the organisms that you would like to uh, see usually fluoresces. It could be bluish white or apple green in color, okay? Now for virology, okay, for all this, you know, this one, this one, and this one, we can use the basic uh, light field microscope that we have in, a bright field microscope that we have in the laboratory. This one would make use of, or would need face contrast microscope or fluorescence microscope. Okay, and then for viruses, they're too small for our uh, bright field microscope. So they would require a special type of microscope known as the electron microscope. Okay, so here, okay, uh, it's either we use the transmission electron microscope or the scanning electron microscope. The difference between those two is that for transmission electron microscope, we are able to see okay, the um, internal structure of the organisms. For scanning electron microscope, we are only able to see the surface, okay, but they can be uh, colored. Okay. So it depends on whatever is available in your lab. But for viruses, microscopy is usually done by use with the use of the electron microscope. So this is how they would look like okay, uh, in the TEM or transmission electron microscope. Okay. So this is the, uh, an example of uh, a TEM image of the coronavirus. Okay. And then we can also visualize them microscopically. You know, we can indirectly identify or determine the presence of viruses by the changes that they cause on the affected cells. Okay? And we call that cytopathic effect. Okay? So cyto cells, pathic, um, the damage or um, changes you know, brought about by the presence of the viruses, okay? So this is known as the warthin finkel d syncytia, a giant cell that may be made up of around 50 nuclei, okay? So these are actually a group of infected cells. This can be commonly seen in um, measles you know, or in herpes infections. Okay, so this is how we make use of microscopy. Okay, so we use this to visualize the morphology of our infectious agent. Now, moving on to our next method of identification, we have culture. Okay, since morphology can only be used to uh, check out the morphology of the organisms, we need more clues to identify our organisms uh, more specifically. Okay. So we need to perform culture, okay? So for bacteriology, mycobacteriology, and mycology, we can make use of artificial culture medias or those that are made up of gelatin and can be uh, poured onto petri dishes like this, okay? So we do culture so that we could identify you know, culture characteristics of the organisms. So to add more clues into the basket, Okay. So through culture, we are able to isolate pure cultures of the organism. So you'll be able to omit uh, contaminants okay, because they will grow differently than the organisms that you would like to see. So this is how they would grow on a blood agar plate. So these are colonies of the organism. This one are colonies of Mycobacterium tuberculosis or the TB bacilli. Okay, so they are described as uh, cauliflower-like colonies. Okay? And these are the colonies of fungal elements. They look like cotton candy, okay? fluffy. 
Okay, now for viruses, no, for viruses, we cannot grow viruses on artificial culture media because viruses are obligate intracellular organisms. They would require living cells in order for them to replicate. Okay, and so we make use of cell cultures. We usually make use of uh, immortal cells in the form of cancer cells. Okay, so they have, uh, they are uh, abnormal types of cells with longer lifespan. So they are usually chosen to, um, to grow viruses in. Okay. Then we have biochemical testing. So recall, no? a comprehension check. So the first method of identification was microscopy, and that could give us the morphology of the organism. Okay? Then we need culture, because that would provide us with the culture characteristics of the organism. Then, because those two are still lacking, you know, the clues that we can get from those two methods would still be lacking. So we need another method. This time, it would be biochemical testing. So for biochemical testing, Okay, uh, of bacteria. Okay, we can uh, perform IMVIC or uh, indole methyl red test, Vogue's per scour test, and citrate test. Okay, so IMVIC stands for indole methyl red, Vogue's per scour, and citrate. The small i here is only added so that the uh, acronym would be easily uh, pronounced. Okay. And then we also have API. Okay, so the biochemical testing is actually a really good um, method of identification, especially for uh, enteric organisms. Okay, so biochemical testing actually forms the precise basis for bacterial species identification. Okay, so after seeing how they would look like, will not give us anything but their morphology. After knowing how they grow on artificial media might give us the genus of the organism, but that will not be enough. Now, when we perform biochemical testing, it would help us identify the species of the organism. So now we have the complete name of our organism. Okay? For, uh, this is uh, used primarily because uh, each organism it has a particular enzymatic system okay, that's akin or special only to that group of organisms or specific organism. Okay? So for mycobacteria, okay, so mycobacteria, uh, one example of a biochemical test that we usually use for that organism is niacin test. For fungal elements, you know, we use one of the biochemical tests that we use to identify fungi is the urease test. So there are other biochemical tests, but I'm just giving you a few examples, okay? Now, why isn't there virology in this list? Remember, viruses are non-living uh, organisms. They are considered acellular, okay? They are incapable of uh, producing um, enzymes, but no? they may have uh, the power to produce, okay? to, to make use of enzymes once they are inside living cells, but they cannot produce it on their own. Okay? So it's quite difficult to perform biochemical tests on viruses because it might just be a reaction of the infected cell or tissue. Okay? Unlike for bacteria, for fungal elements as well, okay? Next, we can perform serological or molecular diagnostic methods. So if we cannot perform biochemical tests for viruses, now we can do serological testing or uh, identify them via molecular methods, okay? So for bacteriology, okay, so all of this, may be identified through molecular diagnosis okay, using PCR. Okay? Serological test is easier, you know, uh, more accessible. Okay? So 
they can also be quite useful to identify these organisms. Okay, so for bacteria, we can form a variety of, uh, we can perform a variety of agglutination tests. So examples would be uh, Weedle test. No? So we have Weedle test for uh, typhoid fever, and then we have the whale felix test for typhus fever. Okay. Uh, for TB bacilli, uh, examples of serological tests that can be done on it would be uh, immunochromatographic tests as well as ELISA. Okay, so ELISA is short for enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. Okay, and then for mycology, okay, so to identify fungal elements um, serologically, we can also use ELISA and uh, fungitel okay so fungitel detects fungal cell wall antigens okay and then for virology okay so serological tests are actually quite useful in determining presence of uh, viral antigens and antibodies okay so examples of serological tests for viral detection we have uh, hepatitis B surface antigen rapid test. We also have HIV tests, okay? Now, once we are done you know, identifying the causative agent, you know, we already have the name of the infectious agent that caused the patient's uh, condition or illness or disease, we can now perform antimicrobial sensitivity testing. Note that this is only performed after you were able to identify the organism. Okay? So this method is uh, done to aid physicians in determining treatment regimen because okay, sensitivity testing indicates which antibiotic is effective in killing the pathogen. Okay. So we test or assay the identified organism against a number of antibiotics. Okay. So there are uh, two methods that we can use. Now we have the disk diffusion method. The most common example of it is the Kirby-Bauer method. Or if you have the time and the materials, then you can perform the broth dilution method. Okay. So usually in the clinical lab, we do the Kirby-Bauer method, okay? So the methods of identification, again, includes microscopy. That would give us the uh, morphology of the organism. Then we do culture to identify uh, culture characteristics of the organism. What does that mean, by the way? When you say culture characteristics, we'll be able to acquire you know, how the organisms grow. Will they need high temperature, low temperature? Do they need uh, oxygen, more oxygen? Or do they need carbon dioxide for growth? Okay, so those things. And then Biochemical test will help us identify the species because it will be able to identify specific enzyme systems within the organism. Serological tests can also be done. Okay? And it is quite helpful for uh, viruses, no? viral detection and identification. Okay? And then of course, molecular testing. So molecular testing can be used to identify all infectious agents, okay? And then once we have identified our organism, we can now proceed with sensitivity testing to identify which antibiotic is best for the organism, okay? Now moving on to the next department or area, we have hematology, okay? So hematology deals with the enumeration of the blood cells and other body fluids. So the most common test performed is uh, CBC or complete blood count. So this includes uh, red blood cell count, white blood cell count, white blood cell differential count. Okay. So what is the difference between the two? When we say differential count, we identify the different uh, white blood cells that are found in the smears okay, or in the samples, and then we count them. Okay. We enumerate them. So there are uh, those with granules, okay? those with uh, 
with those without granules. Okay? So that's what we differentiate when we do differential count. Okay? And then we have uh, hemoglobin determination, hematocrit determination, platelet count, and red blood cell indices. So we will not go through that specifically or in depth. Okay? You will be discussing that in your hematology subject. So these are just examples of what's included in the CBC. Now, apart from the CBC, you know, there are other special procedures that we do like CTBT, you know, clotting time, bleeding time, you know, and other coagulation tests. Okay? So that will also include special tests like uh, uh, OFT you know, or the osmotic fragility test. It's a test used to measure uh, erythrocytes resistance to hemolysis while being exposed to varying levels of uh, saline, no, diluted saline. Okay? And then we can also perform uh, reticulocyte counts. No? Reticulocytes are slightly immature RBCs. Okay? So red blood cells, these are red blood cells, these are mature red blood cells. So they're clear, no? biconcave disc, hollow in the center. Okay? Now reticulocytes are slightly larger sometimes with uh, remnants of uh, nuclear material. No? So we usually count that. Okay? So why sometimes in cases of anemias, no? the body increases production of red blood cells and sends these cells into the bloodstream before they become mature. Okay? And then we can also do ESR no? or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's a type of blood test that measures how quickly red blood cells settle at the bottom of a glass tube. No? So normally, red blood cells settle relatively slow. Okay? However, if a faster than normal rate has been observed, okay, it might be that the patient is experiencing some sort of inflammation in the body. Okay, and we can also do bone marrow cell identification as well as counting. Okay, so when we do this test, it would usually involve staining, you know? and the stains to usually use includes the Romanovsky stain, right stain, gemsa stain, or a combination of the right and gemsa stain. Okay, and there are other stains as well that we can use in the lab. Okay. Now, moving on to another area, we have clinical chemistry. Okay? So clinical chemistry is an area in the clinical lab that's intended for uh, the testing of blood and other body fluids to quantify essential soluble chemicals, including uh, waste products, okay? so for the diagnosis of certain diseases. So example, to diagnose diabetes mellitus, we can uh, perform uh, or determine blood glucose level of a patient. No? So when the request is FBG or fasting blood glucose or FBS, which is more common. So that's fasting blood sugar, or we can also perform uh, glycosylated hemoglobin or HbA1c. Okay? Or when we need to diagnose um, cardiovascular diseases, so we can process uh, samples for lipid profile, no, where we determine the total cholesterol, HDL, no? high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, and triglycerides. And then for um, renal function or renal diseases, we can uh, deter, uh, we can uh, assay the samples for creatinine. Okay, blood urea nitrogen, blood uric acid, okay? and then for total pro protein, no? so we can um, perform total protein, albumin, globulin. We can also process for electrolyte determination, such as sodium, potassium, okay? and then we can also do tests on hormones, no? like thyroid hormones, such as T3, T4, or calcitonin. Apart from thyroid hormones, we can also process you know, uh, parathyroid hormones, pituitary hormones, pancreatic hormones also. 
And then there are also tests for glucocorticoids, catecholamines, uh, testosterone, estrogen, bilirubin, and of course, liver enzymes, and a lot more. Okay, so these are just examples of what we can uh, test uh, or uh, determine in the clinical chemistry department. Okay, so moving on to immunology. So um, for immunology and serology, no? in this area, uh, serum is the usual specimen assay to identify and quantify antigen and antibody, okay? or to investigate disorders of the immune system, such as uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus, and immunodeficiency disorders no? like AIDS or uh, agama globulinemia. Okay? And also in this department, we can determine organ tissue and fluid compatibility for transplantation. Okay. So what are the examples of tests that we can run in this department? So this is where we do uh, determination of viral antigens and antibodies. No? So we test for uh, hepatitis B, surface antigen, hepatitis B envelope, hepatitis C um, uh, antigen also again ito. Okay. And then we have a core rather, no? hepatitis B core antigen. Okay. And then this is also where we test for HIV, hepatitis A virus, hepatitis C virus, cytomegalovirus, uh, chikungunya, missiles, rubella, uh, herpes simplex virus, and of course, the SARS-CoV-2. Okay. So... Uh, we can do antigen testing already and uh, antibody, okay? So using serological methods, okay? Now moving on to another department. Yet again, we have immune, uh, immunohematology or blood banking. So this is also known as blood banking, okay? So it's a branch of immunology which deals with the uses of immunologic principles to study and identify the different blood groups. Now, what do we offer in this area? Okay, so the tests that we usually perform are, uh, of course, blood collection, donor screening, and then, of course, we screen the blood, no? we check for hemoglobin, um, uh, blood type, okay? malarial parasites. We also serologically test for syphilis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, HIV 1 and 2. Okay, we can also perform cross-matching and antibody screening prior to transfusion. And of course, uh, this is the area where we keep you know, blood bags. So we do receiving and releasing of blood for blood transfusion. Okay. Then we have clinical microscopy, so also known as urinalysis and parasitology department. So we can perform urinalysis here. No? So urinalysis is divided into three, uh, three parts. So we have physical or macroscopic examination where we check for um, color, okay, clarity of the uh, samples, and then we do chemical examination. Okay, so using, when we do chemical examination, we use this one, the dipsticks or the combi sticks, okay, or reagent strips, okay. So we simply dip it into a tube containing the urine sample, and then we read it against this chart here uh, on the container. So there are uh, strips with four parameters. So the four parameters include uh, pH, specific gravity, uh, protein, and glucose, okay? And then there are those with 10 parameters. So apart from the four, okay, uh, bilirubin, ketones, blood, urobilinogen, nitrites, and leukocytes are added to make it 10. And then we also have 12 parameters, you know? Reagent strips with 12 parameters includes those in the four parameters and the 10 parameters plus 
microalbumin, and creatinine. So you have 12 parameters in all. So once you're done with the chemical examination, we can now uh, centrifuge the urine sample and decant the supernatant. We have to keep the sediments because what, that's, what we'll go in, that's what we will be using for the microscopic examination. So in the microscopic examination, we do check for cellular components. Okay? We check for RBCs, WBCs, no? other cells like renal cells, renal tubular cells. We also check for crystals and casts. Okay? And of course, microorganisms like parasites and fungal elements that can be seen in urine samples. Okay, so these are examples of the crystals that can be seen in uh, urine sediments. No? So normal crystals like uric acid, uh, calcium oxalate, hypuric acid crystals, calcium phosphate, ammonium biurate, calcium carbonate. No? So this is actually um, due, uh, due to uh, the diet, a patient's diet. And then we have abnormal crystals, which may signify uh, disease states. No? So we have bilirubin, we have tyrosine, cholesterol, cysteine, leucine. And then we have crystals that can be found in urine samples when you're taking certain drugs like sulfur drugs or you're under uh, viral treatment. No? So we have acyclovir and indinavir crystals as well. Okay, so sulfa, uh, sulfa crystals, acyclovir crystals, and indinavir crystals are seen in the urine when you're taking certain types of uh, drugs or treatment. Okay. Then apart from urinalysis, we can also perform seminalysis in this department. Okay? So in seminalysis, we do sperm count. Okay? We do check sperm morphology and sperm motility. Okay? So we also do assays using other body fluids and check for their appearance, cell count, differential counts, uh, perform chemistry tests. And if uh, microbiological tests are needed, then it would be uh, submitted to the microbial laboratory. Okay. Of course, fecalysis is also performed here. No? So fecalysis or stool examination. So very much like um, urinalysis, uh, we also have three parts. Okay. However, um, most of the time, we are limited to physical and microscopic examination. Chemical examinations for stool is usually by request, you know, like uh, fecal fat, occult blood, or other tests. Okay? But physical examination and microscopic examinations are routinely performed. Okay? So for physical examination, we check for color, Consistency, you no. Know, so for consistency, we have uh, wet, watery, okay, uh, formed, soft. Okay, we can also uh, check pH. Okay, and then microscopic examination is done to check usually for the presence of parasites. Okay, and then this may be performed either with saline or Lugol's iodine. Okay. So this one here is, the, both of these are entamoeba cysts, okay? And then this one is done using saline, and this one is done using uh, iodine. So there's a little color, okay? So that's fecalysis. And then we have histopath, okay? So histopathology is actually a department that's separate from the rest of the clinical laboratory. It is usually found outside, uh, or if it's found inside, it's separated uh, by a wall, no? or it's in a different room, okay? So histopathology is actually uh, where we process autopsy and biopsy samples, okay? It's the art and science of producing quality tissue sections to enable the pathologist to diagnose the presence or absence of 
a disease. So what do we usually do in histopath? Okay? So the histopath section may be divided into two based on the uh, samples that we process. No? For uh, human tissues, we usually um, process them. No? We perform gross examination. By the way, this one, gross examination is uh, done mostly by the pathologist. Okay. So after gross examination, the med techs can now, or the histotechs can now uh, process the tissue. And then once it's processed, it can now be sectioned or cut into very thin slices and then placed on the glass slides. And once that's ready, we can now stain them. After staining, the most common stain used is H and E or hematoxylin and eosin staining. And then once that's done, we mount them or cover them with cover slips, okay? And then after that, microscopic examination. Both gross and microscopic examination uh, are done by the pathologist, okay? In the cytology section, that's where we process pop smears, okay? So pop smears are usually stained through a process called Papa Nicolau staining method. There are other um, versions of this, but the base is still Papa Nicolau staining. So we have a cytocolor method, but still it's patterned basically through uh, in Papa Nicolau staining method. Okay. So this is the usual. Uh, machine that you see in the lab, no? the micro, uh, microtome, and then the water bath where we fish out thin sections. Those are the tissue cassettes. Okay? That's a common site in the histopath laboratory. Okay? So the routine test usually starts with gross examination. So again, this is done by the pathologist. So here in this picture, you can actually see a mass, no? most probably a breast a mass, you know, mm -hmm. if not an entire breast, that's being bread loafed. You know? So it is sectioned into thin slices similar to a loaf bread. You know? We call the process bread loafing. It's, it makes it easier for the pathologist to find abnormal areas okay, or areas of interest. And then the pathologist would cut out you know, uh, a few sections, a few samples here and there. Okay, so once gross examination is done, the tissue sections are fixed and then they are dehydrated, cleared. No? So they are fixed using 10% uh, formalin. They're dehydrated using ethanol. They're cleared with the use of silene and they're infiltrated and embedded with the use of uh, wax, no, usually paraffin wax. So once the tissue is encased in wax, we can now cut them into very thin sections like this. So this is sectioning or microtomy. So once they're cut in very thin slices, we lay them down in a warm water bath to allow the sections to stretch out. Okay? And then we fish them out using glass slides like this. And then we stain them and mount them or cover them with cover slips. Okay, so the end products are really pretty when done well. Okay, and now when you have this, it's ready for microscopic examination. Back to you, Doc, again. Okay. Then for the cytology section, now here, so we process uh, pop smears. Initially, you know, the initial purpose of the pop paniculaus stain is to screen for cervical cancer and pre any precancerous changes in the cervix. However, it was later found out that the, the, the staining method Papa Nicolau is really great, not only for uh, cervical samples, but it can be used for a variety of samples, sputum, you know, uh, other body fluids. So they are actually used now for those samples. Okay? So you can also detect uh, sexually transmitted diseases such as trichomoniasis, candidiasis, and uh, HPV or human papillomavirus in pop smears. So 
Uh, this is how smears are usually done by ob -gynes, no? Uh, this is the conventional uh, pop smear. Now, if you have machines with you, like SurePath, this is how the smear would look like. And if you have the thin prep machine, this is how the smear would look like. The machines would make the smears for you. Okay, so that's how easy they are. Okay, so this is a microscopic image of what the smears would contain once they are. Uh, prepared and stained, no? Now, apart from uh, preparation of slides, no, for routine processing, we can also process frozen sections. What's this, okay? So uh, it's a test performed when an immediate or rapid microscopic analysis of the specimen is needed. The patient is still in the operating room. So the surgeon only took a small sample of the a uh, diseased organ and then sent it into the laboratory for um, histologic determination. No? So uh, to check you know, whatever is the problem. Okay? So in this case, the, the pathologist has to be in the laboratory. Okay? So when the sample arrives, he's there. You know, he can uh, process the uh, sample and view the slides thereafter. So this is the cryostat. Okay. It contains a uh, microtome inside. No? So uh, the, it's just that, you know, it's so similar to what you have seen earlier. It's just that this microtome is inside a container that uh, with controlled temperature. So usually we process samples between negative 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. And then lastly, we also do post-mortem examination or autopsy. So we can assist our pathologist when he's going to perform autopsy. Okay? So autopsy is a thorough examination of a dead body to determine the cause of death, the manner of death, and to evaluate any disease or injury that may have been present at the time of death. Okay, so that's autopsy. So it's they don't come that often but uh, it would be good you know if by the time you become interns you get to be exposed to the process okay so again no before we proceed to our uh to fulfilling our last objective let's recap what we have learned uh several minutes ago so uh, there are different areas in the lab. So we have microbiology area, which is where we process uh, samples that may contain infectious agents like bacteria, uh, viruses, and fungi. We use, we perform the different methods of identification like microscopy, culture, biochemical tests, serological tests, or molecular diagnostic methods, and perform sensitivity testing. Then we have hematology, where CBC is usually performed, clotting time, bleeding time is performed, and other special tests you know, like osmotic fragility and ESR and reticulocyte count. Okay? And then we have clinical chemistry, where FBS is usually done, uh, bilirubin, uh, liver function tests, okay? um, Total cholesterol, no? lipid, uh, lipid tests. Okay, so what else? Uh, electrolytes. Okay, and then we have immunology, serology, where we test the patient's serum for identification of uh, viruses, no, which is very common. And then uh, what else? Immunohematology or blood banking, where we do cross matching, where we keep blood bags, okay? where we do um, uh, identification of blood types. Okay? And then we have the clinical microscopy department, where we process urine, stool, uh, semen, and other body fluids. And histopath, where we prepare slides of human tissues and pop smears. Okay, 
So moving on to fulfill our last objective, which is to discuss laboratory professionals. And so let us proceed. Okay. So clinical laboratory professionals, these are the personnel within the laboratory. Okay, so first up, we have our pathologist. Okay, so the pathologist is the head of the clinical laboratory. Of course, um, okay. so the pathologist is a registered physician trained in uh, laboratory medicine. Okay. Uh, they are experts in gross and microscopic examination of tissues, secretions, and excretions of the body. They can also diagnose disease and follow its course okay, and determine the effectivity of treatment as well as to ascertain the cause of death. So this is a basic uh, picture, a usual picture of a... Uh, histopath laboratory. So you see different containers of different tissues. Okay? And then uh, there's also a separate room for um, autopsy. Okay? But those are the things that a pathologist can uh, do. Okay? Then we have the medical technologist. Okay? So the medical technologist are, or is rather, the frontliner of laboratory diagnostics. Okay? So the medical technologist can perform a full range of lab tests no, from the different areas mentioned earlier. Okay? And they're also uh, should be able to confirm the accuracy of the test results because they will be affixing their signatures in the result form. Okay? And then it is also the task of the medtech to repost laboratory findings or results to the pathologist and other physician. Okay? So the medical technologist is actually a graduate of a BSMT or BMLS or BSMLS. Okay? It's a four-year course and should, be, should have been able to pass the licensure exam to be able to work as a med tech in the lab. Okay. Then we have the medical laboratory technician. So the medical laboratory technician uh, can work you know, uh, under the supervision of the med tech. They can perform general tests. Okay. So in the Philippines, uh, a medical laboratory technician is actually a graduate of the BSMT, BMLS, or BSMLS course, okay? uh, but was not able to pass the MedTech licensure board exam successfully. Okay? So a med lab technician uh, should at least have a general rating of 70%. Okay? The... Uh, professional Regulatory Board of MedTech will certify and register that graduate no? or that uh, examinee. Okay? So he or she should be a graduate of the uh, BSMT, BMLS, BSMLS course, but no? uh, was not able to successfully pass the board exam. Okay? And the rating should be at least 70% to get a certification from the Professional Regulatory Board of Medical Technology, okay? Okay, in the U.S., okay, in the U.S., a med lab technician um, should have a special training in addition to a high school diploma or an associate degree. Okay. So in the U.S., they don't necessarily require you to uh, have graduated from BSMT, okay, but they would require you to at least have a high school diploma and a, certi a certificate from a specialized training for this particular task for lab work. Okay. Then we have the phlebotomist. Okay. So the phlebotomist is 
trained to collect blood samples either through skin puncture, venipuncture, and in special cases, arterial puncture. Okay? But graduates of MT, no? MT, MLS, SMLS, okay? are not allowed to um, perform arterial puncture. Phlebotomists that are graduates of respiratory therapy okay? and uh, physicians, may perform arterial puncture. So nowadays, uh, MT interns, no, medtech interns can perform the procedure under the supervision of a licensed staff or the clinical instructor. Okay? In the Philippines, the phlebotomists are medtechs as well. Okay? They are graduates of the MLS, okay? MT, SMLS course. However, in the US, no, in the United States, and probably in some areas in Europe, uh, they will not require you to graduate uh, from a baccalaureate degree, but you know, they would need a, a high, high school diploma at least, and uh, specialized training in phlebotomy. Okay? So about 40 hours of classroom training and about 100 hours of um, internship or uh, practical training. Okay, so they would require you 100 hours of uh, training in the laboratory. Then you'll need to be certified by uh, a certifying body. So it could be uh, the American Society of Clinical Pathology or ASCP, or it could be the National Credentialing Agency or NCA or the American Society of Phlebotomy Technicians, or ASPT, okay? So that's the requirement for uh, US phlebotomists. But for the Philippines, the phlebotomists are the medtechs themselves, okay? Then we have the cytotechnologist, okay? So under the supervision of a pathologist, a cytotechnologist is responsible for the following task. One, Okay. to prepare slides containing uh, examples of um, samples, rather sample cells for microscopic examination. So they'll need to perform uh, special chemical staining techniques for this, like the Papa Nicolau staining, you know, like this. Okay. And then uh, to evaluate cells for the presence of cancer, precancerous changes or infections. And lastly, to provide an interpretation of all patient samples to the pathologist. Okay, so after the pathologist will view, those interpretations may actually be changed. Okay, so in the Philippines, uh, the cytotechnologist is still performed by uh, MTs no, or medtechs assigned in the histopath section of the lab. So they work closely with the pathologist to arrive in a uh, final diagnosis. In the US, okay, uh, they would require you to graduate from a baccalaureate degree or a four-year course with a very strong science background. So uh, allied health courses. No? So, uh, BS bio graduates can actually, or biology graduates can actually work as a uh, cytotechnologist because uh, it's part of their training as uh, biology students to be exposed to histolo uh, histolo histologic slide preparation. Okay, so at least uh, the background is there. Plus, okay, uh, one year training, you know, post baccalaureate program would be required. You know, and it should be in a hospital that offers uh, cytology, okay, cytology services. Okay, so one year training. But in the Philippines, this is still the med tech. Okay, then we have the histotechnologist. Okay, so the histotechnologist uh, prepares. You know, 
uh, processes and stains, biopsies, and tissue specimen for microscopic examination of the pathologist. Okay? So these two technologists are uh, trained no, to freeze, to use the cryostat, to cut, to use the microtome, to mount, and to stain tissues to create slides like this. Okay? Okay, this is the work of the um, histotechnologists to prepare this uh, for the pathologist. Okay? So in the Philippines, it would still be the med tech, okay? but uh, abroad, you will be required to have a baccalaureate degree with at least 30 hours in chemistry and biology and one year clinical program. You know? And then of course, you should be ASCP certified, okay? So ASCP, this would require ASCP certification in the US, okay? So they may be uh, graduates of other baccalaureate degrees, but they would require specialized training for uh, histotechnology, okay? So again, in the Philippines, this is still the med tech uh, on duty in the histopath area, okay? So to recall the specific learning objectives that we mentioned earlier, okay? So distinguish the different types of healthcare setting. So you were able to cover this. So uh, we understand that there are several types of uh, healthcare setting, which includes acute care hospitals. Okay? This also includes uh, urgent care centers. This would also include rehabilitation centers, long-term care facilities, um, specialized outpatient services, and outpatient sur uh, surgery centers. Okay? Then you're able to identify the different clinical areas in the lab. Okay, and identify uh, procedures done in each. So again, we have microbiome, you know, microbiology department where we process samples for the identification of bacteria, viruses, fungi. And then we have hematology where we usually do CBC. We have clinical chemistry where we process for electrolytes and fasting blood sugar. And then we have Immunology and serology, where we usually do tests you know, to identify antigen and antibody levels, uh, antigen and presence of antigen and antibody uh, concerning different uh, viruses. Okay? And then we have blood banking or immunohematology, where we perform cross matching, uh, blood typing. Okay? And then we have uh, clinical microscopy, where we do urinalysis, fecalysis, seminalysis, and we have the histopath area where we process human samples into uh, fine you know, slides for microscopic evaluation, and then pop smears, okay? So those are the different areas. And then departments in the hospital, so we were able to cover that as well. Okay, so we have the, of course, the clinical lab, uh, pharmacy, administration, medical records, environmental services, uh, dietary, mm, we have the EKG section, the EEG section, PT, RT, okay, and all those other sections that were mentioned. And then lastly, uh, we were able to identify the different members of the lab. Okay? So we have the pathologist, who is the head of the laboratory, the medical technologist, the uh, medical lab technician, the phlebotomist, the cytotechnologist, and the histotechnologist. Okay? So again, these are our objectives for this activity, and we were able to identify them. Okay. So thank you for listening. Okay. By the way, refer to your um, uploaded 
laboratory manuals to check out what activity or group activity has been prepared for you. Okay. Thank you and God bless.